we'd like to encourage everyone to download our New Life app today. To find it, go to the App Store and type in New Life CC. Our app has a lot of great features. You can download the sermon notes, you can watch sermons, or listen to them. You can also give directly through the app, turn in a prayer request, and get Facebook updates. It even includes a Bible app with it. So take advantage of this great resource today. We are really excited to share a great free online service with you that will help you take one step closer to Jesus. It's called Right Now Media. Right Now Media is the Netflix of Bible study material with over 14,000 videos. These videos will help you in parenting, finances, and in leadership. It has great videos for your marriage, for your relationships, and even great videos for your kids all in one place. We are excited to be able to give it to you absolutely free. You can sign up for Right Now Media under the media section on our app today. We hope you will dive in for your own spiritual growth as you take one step closer to Jesus. I want you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 20. And we are going to launch into a brand new message series today, and we're going to do that in just a moment. So you're getting all those things situated, and while you're doing that, I want to just share with you uh, a couple things. So today is a real transition weekend for us here at New Life, something we have never experienced in the history of our, of our church. But we have a group of, of staff, a team that is amazing, that God has brought together, and this is their last weekend to be here on our campus in a regular basis. They will still be back, but on a regular basis. Because starting next weekend, our New Life Patterson campus is going to launch three preview services. So a preview service is a regular service with a lot of explanation. Uh, So they're trying to get their teams up to speed to let them know what to expect and what to do. So they'll be explaining a lot of things as they go along, but giving everyone a taste of what it's going to be like at our New Life Patterson campus. And then coming on Easter weekend, on that April 1st, they are going to launch full-time as our campus in Patterson and throughout the west side. And we are just so excited about what that means. That has been a long-time dream being realized that we felt all those years ago, God kind of tapping us on the shoulder saying, there's something for you out here on the west side of the valley. And all those years of praying and preparing and all those things, bringing the right people, God has finally brought it to this point and we're excited about the launch of this campus. So in just a moment, I'm gonna have that Patterson leadership team come on up here and we're gonna commission them and pray over them and do that. But before they come, we have been working on a New Life Patterson video and it's gonna be going out into social media today. You'll be able to see it, but we wanted to give you a chance to see the video right here today. So sit back for a moment and watch this video. About 10 years ago, my wife Gina and I were coming back from the Bay Area, and we took the exit into Patterson on our way back. And and I remember thinking, Patterson is such a neat little community. One day, I wonder if God is leading us to plant a New Life campus here. As we came through those miles of palm trees on either side of the road, we start looking into those hills and we thought, this is a beautiful place. We see this clear distinction between the old historic agricultural Patterson and then there's this new industrial progressive side of Patterson that's been influenced by the Bay Area and so many different commercial places in our state and we see it all having this focus right here in Patterson. There have been lots of major corporations that have moved here over the last decade, and you see it impacting the valley and this community in particular. As you know, with the surge of industry and business comes an incredible influx of people as well. I remember that day driving into Patterson and seeing literally hundreds and hundreds of homes being built and recognizing that with those homes is people. A new life has always been about people. In fact, our passion, our heart, is loving people one step closer to Jesus. And this growth in Patterson and beyond has been incredible. Just 20 years ago, there were 7,000 people who called Patterson their home. Now, over 22,000 people. Think of the hundreds of families every single year moving into this community. Over this last year, we've been working really hard to find a location, putting all the right people into place, the right team in place, making connections in and around the community and praying about how God wants to use us to impact 
the city of Patterson. Remember, our passion is to love people one step closer to Him. And in that, we desire to make room and a place for people to find and experience Jesus. What once was a dream 10 years ago, God is making a reality. His timing is perfect, and we believe that He has given us just the right people for just the right season. Not only for new life, but for Patterson and the West Side as well. Well, my name is Jeremy Moore, and I came on staff in March of 2017 as the campus pastor for New Life Patterson. So I first received a phone call from one of the staff members uh, here from New Life, and that was back in December of 2016. And he started telling me about all these amazing things that are happening here at New Life in the Central Valley of California, and telling me about all these great things. And so I remember distinctly listening to everything he's saying and then hanging up the phone and looking over to my wife and saying, this is great. There's a lot of great things happening, but I am not moving to California. There's earthquakes in California, so I'm not going to California. So the more I began to talk to the leadership of this church out in the valley, I began to think, man, we could actually do this. There really is something special happening in and through New Life Christian Center in the Central Valley of California, and maybe we could be a part of something special. And now we are just so excited about what God is going to do, not only in the communities of Patterson, but also the surrounding communities and Gustine and Newman and Crow's Landing. We've been living here for almost a year now. My kids go to school here in Patterson. We've already met city officials. We've already been involved in community projects. And we just cannot wait to get this campus off the ground. And now God has begun to put this amazing team together. We have our own worship director. We have a kids director. We have an associate pastor. And so it, it, it's just been really uh, uh, dynamic to watch God pull all of these people together. And we get to be a part of this. There are some amazing churches already in the city of Patterson. They've been here for decades. They have longevity. They have rich history. And now we get to bring our own footprint, our own DNA into something special and be a part of this faith family. The people and staff of New Life are authentic. Our music is relevant. Our messages are practical. And our mission, to love people just one step closer to Jesus. And Patterson... Now it's your turn. Yeah, isn't that cool? I tell you, every time I watch that, it's just like, that is an answer to prayer. That's an answer to prayer. And I'm going to ask our Patterson uh, launch team to come on up here, and uh, we're going to pray over them. Give them a hand as they come. So you know Pastor Jeremy and Janet, and they moved out here from Wisconsin, uh, to, and they did, into earthquake territory, uh, <laughs> to be a uh, part of this and, and lead this team. Uh, and some of these other ones you may know, you may not, but I want to introduce them to you. So this is Anna, and she's going to be our children's director. Freddie, and you've seen him lead worship here. He's uh, leading worship there at the Patterson campus. Tito is going to be a ministry associate out there, and Jacob is going to be tech and sound. And it is no accident that God has brought these people together, this exact team, to do some great work out in the West Side. And it's amazing that uh, we're all in this team together, and yet it's going to happen in two different locations. Because if you haven't been clear about it, we're still one church, and it's just going to happen in two different places. And to know that what's happening out there is going to mirror and bring the heart and the passion and the kind of the spirit of, of new life out into a new area is just exciting to see uh, happen. And so I know that beyond this team, there are many others, volunteers and leaders who are part and who have already said, I'm in and I'll be part of that. Some of you who are here today uh, live out in the West Side area and you're already part of what's going on. And so in these next weeks, I'm gonna challenge you to be praying for these preview services and we're gonna be reporting back to you what God is doing and you're gonna hear it, you're gonna see it and it's gonna be just this amazing, thing over these months and over these years to watch how God brings his good news, brings hope and freedom and life to the West Side and to Patterson. Because you know, from the very beginning, it's never been about us. 
It's not about our name. It's not about who we are. It's all about pointing to Jesus and loving people closer to him. So be praying as, uh, as we launch this, this, uh, this next week. So Jeremy and I were talking about this time, and, and traditionally this is called a commissioning, uh, but that doesn't even sound like us. It sounds like I should shake their hand and give them a certificate, and we're not going to do that today, so we're going to pray over them. Uh, but as we were looking at this whole concept of commissioning, I went to the thesaurus online and think, well, are there some other words to describe this? And so listen to some of the terms that kind of bring about this same idea and heart as commissioning. To appoint, to assign, to commit, to charge, to empower, to enable, to engage, entrust, invest, select, and send. And we're gonna pray today as we send this team out to, to make an impact in a new area. And here's the amazing thing is I thought about some of those words. As God has entrusted them to us, we are now entrusting them into a community to make a difference. And as, as God has invested in each one of them and as in us, they're gonna be able to invest in lives and people. And I'm telling you, we're gonna hear stories of hundreds of people that have been uh, saved and have found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're gonna hear stories about marriages restored, families that have been transformed. We're gonna hear stories of freedom and life. We're gonna hear all of that because of this willingness to take kind of this risky, courageous step of faith and say, God, we're gonna follow you in this move to Patterson. So as we pray for this team, I'm gonna ask you to do something that is a little different. Maybe you've never done this before, but oftentimes when we pray for someone, we'll put a hand on their shoulder and there's nothing inherently holy about that move. It's just personal. We're doing that. So I'm gonna ask you today as I pray for them, since we can't all gather around them, I'm gonna ask you right where you're sitting just to kind of stretch out your hand like you're putting it on their shoulder and we're gonna pray together. So stretch out your hand and let's pray. Father, today we thank you so much for your call, for your vision, for your heart for people. Not just here in this area, but Lord, literally all over the world because people matter to you. And Lord, as, as you have been doing great work here among us, and God, we're humbled by that, but you've also challenged us to move out beyond, to plant these lighthouses of hope. And Lord, as, as we begin to launch this New Life Patterson campus, I pray, God, that you would do mighty things. God, I thank you for these leaders. I thank you for Jeremy and for Janet and for Anna and Freddie and Tito and Jacob. Thank you, God, for their willingness to step into uh, kind of a challenging situation, to not even know what's around the corner, but to boldly step in and trust you. I pray, God, that you would bless them. I pray that you would use them. I pray, God, that, that they would have conversations and interactions that they never could have dreamed of having, Lord, as, as they love people closer to you. Lord, I pray for us as a church together, one church in multiple locations, that you'd give us wisdom as we take steps forward. Lord, that you would bring about your blessing and your direction because God, we, we only wanna do what you're leading us to do. And so we thank you for this moment, this historic moment, God, when we, when we launch this new campus. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, we honor you today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you give a round of applause and thank this team for all they're doing? Love you guys. They have been around for four services this weekend. Can you believe that? Hey, if you have your note-taking sheet, we're going to dive into this, uh, this message today in this new series called The Shape of Jesus. And leading up to, to Easter, we're going to be taking a look at the teaching and the life of Christ, his character, and how in the process of that, God is, is molding us more and more into his likeness. Uh, when I was a kid, I received a, a Christmas present, and I loved this present, uh, and it was called Creepy Crawlers. Does anyone remember Creepy Crawlers? Thank you. Thank you. I felt so old. You know, people were going like, what? What is that? Well, Creepy Crawlers, how it worked is they had these uh, little metal plates and they were forms and they were like indentations that were shaped like bugs and worms and 
caterpillars and all kinds of things. And you took this goop and you put it into those in different colors, you could do all that. And then you put it right in this little oven heating element thing that would fuse that goop into like a rubbery bug. This is in the days when you gave kids heating elements and stuff like that with no safety precautions. You could just do whatever you wanted. And you'd have these bugs and you know, I could scare my sister and do all those things. And it was just this really cool thing. But I've been thinking about that as we've been talking on our staff and our team about this whole idea of the shape of Jesus and how God, again, takes situations and circumstances, even those heated moments of our life when we feel like we're in the, the pressure cooker to fuse us and to shape us to respond like Jesus. Now, this isn't God trying to make you somehow different than how he uniquely wired you. Sometimes we think we're going to lose our personality or our sense of humor. And they'll say, no, no, no. God loves how he made you. He's given you the gifts and abilities that he's given you. He's given you the sense of humor and the likes and dislikes and, and all that makes you unique and wonderful. God loves that about you. But that's like kind of the raw form. And yet God still wants to take and shape you, the unique person that you are, more and more in your responses that that you leave kind of this taste of Jesus uh, in people's mouths when they encounter you. That there's something that's like, what is it about you? And it's because of Christ in you, his work in you that is transforming and making you different. Again, you're still you, but there's this Jesus part to you. And all through the Bible, we we see the teaching of, of becoming more and more that way. The The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, he wrote this. He said, we will hold on to the truth in love. Now listen to this. Becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. It's kind of molding more and more into Christ's image. So imagine that the encounters that you have, the conversations that you have, that people would just get this sense of Jesus from you. So over these next weeks, we're going to dive into that. And today, we're going to look at how grace shapes us. Now, gr- grace literally means unmerited favor. In other words, it's God's favor towards you and towards me that we don't deserve and we haven't earned it. This is not God owing it to us. We haven't done enough good stuff. that God's well, okay, I guess I'll give you my mercy and my love and all those things. Grace says we don't earn it. We can't earn it. We're not, we haven't done enough. We haven't done anything for it, but he gives it to us nonetheless. That's what grace really is. After our first service this morning, I had a woman come up to you. She goes, I have the perfect story for grace. She said, uh, I left my house this morning to come to church and I kind of rolled through a stop sign and sure enough, there was a police officer there, pulled me over and he goes, well, where are you headed? And she said, well, I was going to church. And he says, you know, God will wait if you stop at the stop sign. (laughs) And uh, she's like, I know. And, And she goes, and he didn't give me a ticket. And she goes, that's the picture of grace. I deserved it. I, I, you know did the crime and now you got to do the time, you know, that whole thing. She goes, I know I deserved it. But in this moment, he said, okay, I'm going to let you go with a warning. And she said, you know, as you talked about grace day, I realized that I was the recipient of grace this morning. And every time we look through the Bible, especially in Jesus' own life, his teaching, what he did, you see these extensions of grace. And it's really pretty shocking. It's amazing that how he offered it to people that we would look at and say, "Well, well, they didn't even deserve it. Because here's the thing, grace always makes us do a double take. Grace always makes us go, oh yeah, wait, what? That person? That person was given mercy? That person was extended love? It just doesn't make sense to us. And you can can read through. I mean, people like the woman at the well, do you remember that story? She was in relational chaos in her life. And yet, while she should have been you know, treated a certain way, Jesus instead extended this grace and mercy to her. Not excusing. Grace isn't just going, oh, the stuff you did didn't matter. It's not saying, oh, it's no big deal. It really is a big deal. That's why grace is so powerful. And you think of Matthew, the tax collector, who everyone really kind of pushed to the sidelines and Jesus said, come and follow me. The woman caught in adultery who should have been punished for, for the crime that was in that, in that culture. And yet Jesus said, what? No one condemns you. Go and sin no more. 
and the thief on the cross who really did deserve to be on a cross, who really did deserve to have his life forfeit. And yet, what did Jesus say? Today, you'll be with me in in paradise. And we can read those stories about Jesus, and yet we do them with a little bit of distance and a little bit of detachment, right? Well, those were, those were such kind moments that Jesus extended. You know, just, it's wonderful that he would do that because we're not up close. But what about when it's someone that, that we really do know? What about when it hits home for us and we think, wait a minute, surely God's grace can't be for them. Surely he wouldn't extend it to someone like that. Like what if, what if grace was extended to the, I don't know, the shooter in Florida? And we think, oh, really? For people like that? Again, not excusing anything. Not saying what he did didn't, didn't matter or that it's just okay. It's not that at all. But if grace is really powerful, then it's true for all of us. It's true for your spouse when they make you crazy or your kids when they disappoint you, or for your boss or supervisor or teacher or professor that you have, that you just, oh, they make your life miserable. And, and yet, is God's grace for them? What about for your ex? What about for that family member that was so rude to your kids? See, if grace is powerful, if grace is true and it's real, then it really does apply to all of us. Because here's the truth we're going to have to somehow come to terms with. We all fall short. We're all in need of grace. So we're going to dive into some of Jesus' teaching today. In fact, we're going to look at a parable that he told. And a parable is is not meant to be a line-by-line view of theology, but a parable is meant to be a picture of truth. And when Jesus told a parable, it was always about something. It wasn't a true story, but it was a truism. So he would tell something and we'd go, oh yeah, I know how that works. And he's, the one we're going to look at today is he's going to tell a story about working, working a job. And all of us will go, well, I've worked a job. I know what it's like to work hourly or for salary or whatever it might be. And, and we know how, how employment works, right? You are trading some of your life for resources in return. You're getting a paycheck back. I know that seemed really depressing to some of you. Wait, I'm trading my life? You're actually trading your life for money. And so you can pay your bills and you go, oh, that's how it works. But we all go, oh, I know, I know how, that, how that transpires. I know how that goes around. And yet Jesus is gonna take this little twist and we're gonna go, oh, wait, oh, that applies To me, because Jesus in this parable is not actually teaching us about employment. He's going to be teaching us about his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and how it operates and how it works. And in his teaching, he is going to begin to form us and shape us by his grace. So if you're there in Matthew 20, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. It says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of an estate who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed to pay the normal daily wage and he sent them out to work. So let me pause there for a second. So again, you see Jesus himself saying, listen, I'm about to teach you about the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God, how it operates, how it works. Specifically, he's going to teach us about this concept of grace. Then he begins to explain there's this owner, he has a vineyard and uh, this estate. So he goes out early one morning. So let me tell you how this works. Early one morning means six o'clock in the morning. Because in that culture, a work day started, especially out in the fields, it started at sunrise and went to sunset. So it was literally kind of a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. thing. Just so you know, that's how the work day went. So he's gone out and he has hired a group of people at 6 a.m. early in the morning and he sent them out and he said, I'm going to pay you the daily wage for your labor today. And he goes, now look at verse three. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. And at noon, and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. So you're catching this? 
Guys go to kind of a central place in town and, and foremen and managers of, of property, they would come in and say, you, 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 and you, come with me. I've got a day's work for you today. And guys would show up. Have you, I don't know if you've ever seen this. I've been in places where like around hardware stores or lumber yards, sometimes people will gather hoping to get hired for the day. And that's what they would do on this. But here's the kind of tricky part that happens, starting at verse five. So at five o'clock that evening, now remember, this is one hour before quitting time. At five o'clock, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. And he asked them, why haven't you been working today? And they replied, because no one hired us. And the owner of the estate told them, then go on out and join the others in my vineyard. And we're going to pick it up again in a few minutes, but I want us to stop right here for a moment. Understand this, this owner has hired now five groups of people. His 6 a.m. first start at 9, at 12, at 3, and then one hour before closing time, he hires this last little group of people. So here's my question for you. What kind of workers do you think he got at 6 o'clock in the morning? Right? He got the A team, right? These are the people, they're ready. They're up early. They're, they're, they're probably young and strong and they're ready to go. They're just saying, come on, hire me, hire me. I'm ready to go. And so he hires them and, and they head out to work. Now at nine and at 12 and at three, what kind of workers do you think he's getting? You're getting B team, C team, the D team. You know, I mean, as the day goes on, it's, who's left? It's the less desirable workers, Right? They're, they're hanging around. They're wondering, am I going to get a job today or not? And, and it keeps going down and down and down. And by the time he hires the five o'clock workers, he has officially arrived at the bottom of the barrel. These are the guys that nobody wants, that nobody's hired. They're probably older. They're probably not as strong, not as fast, not as able. They may have physical issues. They may have health issues. They're just simply trying to provide for their family. And they're out there thinking, nobody is... Can you imagine getting passed up at three o'clock in the afternoon thinking, oh man, there's nothing happening for me today. Well, that's these guys. That's who's left. But what what does this owner say to those at five o'clock? He says, I want you to go out and I want you to join the others in my vineyard. They're thinking... This is unbelievable. At least I'll get an hour's worth of work in. Now remember, Jesus is telling us what his kingdom is like. Not what employment looks like. Not what it looks like to get a paycheck. He's telling us what his kingdom looks like. And this teaching is meant to mold us and shape us. So I'm going to give you a couple things I want you to write down. The first is this. Jesus gives grace that is personal. Jesus gives grace that is personal. And we're going to find out in just a moment, because we're going to read to the end of this little section, that this owner had a foreman. He had someone who was managing his, his vineyard for him. But instead of sending his foreman into the town to get the workers, which is what owners would do, they wouldn't go in themselves. But this owner decided that he wanted to do that. So this guy personally took the step to be involved, connected, and to be concerned about those people. In fact, those who had been neglected and dismissed, what did he do? He looked him in the eye and said, come be a part of this. Come join me. I've got something for you. I know you've been passed over. I know nobody has wanted you today, but I want you. In the same way, Jesus does not stay distant from you and I. Regardless of how capable you are or how much you have struggled, no matter how much life has been smooth or that you're loaded with with baggage, Jesus comes and he says, I want to be personally involved with you. No matter what you bring to the table, no matter what your past is like, Jesus said, come join me in this. He's giving us an example of how his kingdom works. It's not the young and the best and the brightest and the fastest. He's looking for anyone who's willing. He says, come. Now look at verse eight. I'll finish reading this out. He says, that evening he told the foreman to call the workers in and to pay them, beginning with the last workers first. Now I want you to catch the drama here. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each of them received a full day's wage. 
What do you think those people who worked for one hour but got a full day's wage were doing on their way out? I mean, you know, they're like, yes, I can't believe it. They're probably high-fiving each other, you know, and they they just can't believe their good fortune in this. But now there's other people watching this, right? Those who had been to work earlier. It says, when those hired earlier came to get their pay, they assumed, they made some assumptions, that they would receive more. But they too were paid a full day's wage. And when they received their pay, they protested. They said, wait, those people worked only one hour and yet you've paid them as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And the owner answered one of them. And he said, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? And of course, the answer would have been, well, well yeah, that's what I agreed to. He says, well, take it and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it, against, is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be angry because I'm kind? That's the one that's going to kill us. Okay, I'm just telling you. And he says this, and so it is that many who are first now will be last then, and those who are last now will be first then. I can only imagine what those 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. guys felt like, you know, Can you imagine them coming home? They're used to being picked over, left over, trying to make ends meet with just a little bit. They don't have a lot they can bring to the table. They're just trying to make it. Can you imagine them coming home and walking through the door? And their wife is like, oh, here we go again. How'd it go? And them going, there's my paycheck. What? How much did you get? I got a full day's wage. Can you believe it? And they're going, No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Well, who in the world would pay you a full day's wage for an hour's work? And I'm going, I don't know. But this owner did. And for the first time in a very long time, they've been a recipient of generosity and grace. And I can imagine those guys putting their head down to go to sleep that night and saying, I don't know, but I want to work for that guy tomorrow. (laughs) If I can get hired on, I am in. But what about those that worked all day? What do they think? They had complaints, and what did they say? It's not fair. You made them equal to us. And we have put in more, we're entitled to more, we've worked more through the heat of the day, we have done everything, we've earned this, you owe us something more. So here's the tough question. And this is the one that we all have to wrestle with. Write it down for number two. The tough question, do I want fairness or do I want grace? Now think of these people in this story that have been working. Do they like it that the owner is generous? They do not. Because they don't want generosity. They're not looking for grace. They're looking for what is fair. And it frustrates them that these other people have somehow gotten in and now they get the same as they do. Now, I want you to think about this. Who's Jesus speaking to in the story? If you go back and look, you'll see that he's actually talking to his disciples, the ones who are following after him. So if we kind of parallel that to today, who's Jesus talking to now? He's talking to those of you who have made a decision to follow after Jesus Christ those of you who would call yourself Christians, those of you who would be good church people. He's talking to you and me. And he's saying, do you like me being generous? And if we're really honest, we'll say yes when it's directed towards me. But not when it's those other people who who don't deserve it. Those people that look at how they're living or look at what they're doing or look what's, what's going on. I... I want want fair, but deep down, the truth is, is that we're all in desperate need of grace. And that's what's so amazing about grace. Grace isn't fair. And there are times when grace makes us frustrated and mad, and we struggle with the generosity of God towards people that we don't think deserve it, that we've done our part. But I will tell you this, everyone who is broken, everyone who's hurting, everyone who's been left out and picked over, they experience God's generosity and grace and they are amazed and they are shocked and they are humbled. And by the way, 
That is all of us. That is every single one of us. Because at some level, at some point, we know that we come up short. And we can wrap ourselves in in a nice exterior and everyone thinks, wow, everything's going great. But we know inside where we fall short. We know our, our mistakes. We know where we've hurt people. We know where we've, we've disobeyed God. We know all the, we, we know it deep in here. And we know we're the ones who need grace. Those last workers got way more than they thought. But everyone who thinks they've earned it and they want fair. And that's why it's so kind of frightening to read about this. This, this is about people who follow God. Or say, no, 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 it's for us, but it's, it's, it's not for them. But you know what the Bible teaches are our true fair wages? Paul wrote this in Romans 6, 23. He said, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, our disobedience, our sin, comes with a consequence. It has separated us from God. And there's nothing we can do to somehow make it better because we're not perfect. We don't have it all together. So Jesus came to go to a cross and offer us this free gift of forgiveness and grace if we'll simply take it. We are all in need of that grace. That's what's so amazing. But see, the world keeps trying to fit us into a different kind of mold. The world tells us it's a dog-eat-dog world. It's what you're going to get for yourself. If you can earn it, man, it is yours. Take it, grab it, do whatever you can. That's what the world tells us, right? It's really the rule of the pinata. You ever been to a party where there's a pinata and the kids are trying to, trying to beat that thing? And finally, when it breaks over, you've been at those parties. All the kids are circled around. And when it finally breaks open, who gets the most candy? The kid who's shoving people out of the way, putting it up in his shirt. And, shoving, and you see this little girl on the side digging a piece, one piece of candy out of the grass. That's all she got because she was nice. And nice doesn't get you anywhere, right? That's what the world tells us. So, man, you got to push. And, and you know, if you're going to get ahead in business, man, you better make it happen. If you're going to get ahead in relationships, you better make it happen. The strong thrive, the weak, man, they just get by. But here's what I want you to hear. At some point, life always takes a turn, doesn't it? Life always takes a turn. And you and I, we're going to get hit, and we're going to get hit hard. And some of you are already, you know that, because you've walked through hit after hit after hit. It might be your marriage, it might be your family, it might be school or work or career, finances, your health, habits, temptations, and those things are going to come like a flood and it's going to knock you sideways. And in those moments, can I tell you this? You're not going to be looking for fair. You're going to be looking for grace. You're not going to be looking to say, hey, hey, God, I went to church. You owe me, God. Did you see me? I was sitting in church today. I even put something in the offering for goodness sake. God, you owe me something big. I'm doing what I can. It's not going to be our lists trying to prove ourselves to God. We're going to be looking for the gracious, generous hand of Jesus that will take hold of us. And Jesus tells us that he's the one who goes to the end of the line to that 5 p.m. worker and says, I am for you and I love you. Write this down for the last one. All I really have is because of Jesus the Apostle Paul was so overwhelmed by this fact that in 1 Corinthians 1, here's what he wrote. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. And I know when I read that, it's like, hey, hey, wait a minute. And he says, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. It's all from him. We don't have anything to boast about except Jesus. There's no keeping score. There's no God you owe me. All I have, all you have, is because of God's grace. And it's amazing. And it's outrageous. So here's what you need to know. There's hope for the latecomers. 
There's hope for the broken and the failures. And it's a warning against the good church people that you can never earn this. You can never stack up enough deeds that that tilts the scale. You can't keep score with God because he is extravagant in his grace. On the bottom of your sheet, I put a quote from Brennan Manning, and I want to read it to you as we close. He wrote this, "My my (laughs) my (laughs) My life is a witness to vulgar grace, a grace that amazes as it offends, a grace that pays the eager beaver who works all day long the same wages as the grinning drunk who shows up at 10 till 5. A grace that hikes up the robe and runs breakneck towards the prodigal, reeking of sin and wraps him up. A grace that raises bloodshot eyes to a dying thief's request, please remember me, and assures him, you bet. A grace that is the pleasure of the Father fleshed out in the carpenter Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who left his Father's side, not for heaven's sake, but for our sakes, yours and mine. This vulgar grace is indiscriminate compassion. It works without asking anything of us. It's not cheap, it's free. And as such, it will always be a banana peel for the orthodox foot and a fairy tale for the grown-up sensibility. Grace is sufficient even though we huff and puff with all our might to try to find something or someone that it cannot cover. But grace is enough. He is enough. Jesus is enough. Would you bow your heads with me? As we close our time this morning, I I just felt it would be so wrong to just quickly end and not give you a chance to respond to the grace of Jesus Christ who went to a cross and gave up his life so that you could be forgiven and free. We call it the great exchange that he takes my sin, my stain, all the junk in me and instead he gives me life and hope and freedom, a brand new beginning, a clean slate. So if you're here this morning and you just say, Dave, I have been running from God. I have been trying to make it on my own. And what I truly know that I need is the grace of Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. It's a prayer of salvation, a prayer of new beginning, where Jesus becomes Lord and Savior, the, the rescuer and the leader of your life. And I'm wondering if you're here today and you're ready to put your life in his hands. So with no one looking around, if that's you, if you're ready to take that step, would you just raise your hand today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I see in the back, all over. Would you pray this prayer? Just pray it out loud with me today and let it be, let it be your heart that says these words. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. And thank you for extending your grace. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy towards us that we don't deserve, that we can't earn, but you give it anyway because you absolutely love us. And God, we're floored by that. We're shocked by it. We're amazed that you would do that. But God, we are so grateful. And Lord, I pray for each of these who have taken a step today to put their life in your hands. I pray, God, that they would trust you more and more each day, that they would follow you, that they would walk in obedience and faith. And God, that you would do incredible things in them and through them as they walk with you. Lord, we love you. We pray this all today in Jesus' name. Amen.